Good day, my friends. I want to talk to you about Paul's letter to Ephesians. On my table, you can see two types of writing material. One from Egypt, a real papyrus. I brought it myself. And the second one is a piece of parchment, a real leather of calf or any kosher animal. I brought it from Israel. On this piece of parchment is written Shema Israel, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Elohim, a heart. In the first line, you can see two letters written in bold. One is Yod with three lines, like a crown. And another one is Dalet. Together, Yod and Dalet will organize the word Yod, which means the witness. Paul was a witness of Christ in a pagan metropolis. It is credo of any Jewish person. It is a profession of belief, part of scroll that you roll very thinly and you put it in mezuzah. And you stick it in mezuzah and put it on a doorpost. You can see it on any official buildings, municipalities, any entry of the Jewish house. You can see the ink jar with a sharpened eagle feather. Or it can be simple geese feather. Just need a special instrument and skill to sharpen it. Did Paul write on papyrus or on parchment? As a professional in leather making, he would prefer probably the parchment. But we don't know his financial situation in the time when he was writing Ephesians letter. So we will leave it to ask him in heaven. As a highly educated person, as a Pharisee, as a Jew, he would be very well educated in Aramaic, Hebrew and Greek and probably Latin. In all three languages would be not a problem for me for him to write on. But one weakness he had, and this weakness his eyes. He would allow the writer to write it down for him and with his own hand he would sign it in a big letters. When the scroll is completed it would be rolled and with the special seals and seal stamp it would be stamped in many places. The more important document the more seals we will find on the letter. In Revelation, we find seven seals, the highly important document. Document will be open, which means seals will be broken only with the witnesses. Now you can imagine how the letters of Paul went around the entire Roman Empire, small Asia and beyond. Imagine in Ephesus, 250,000 population city, would be merchants and would be traders and would be visitors, tourists from all over the world coming for the worship of pagan gods of Roman Empire, coming to do their trades and they would find the Sabbath keeping uh, believers and they would come to worship together and in that time, in that moment, the letter would be opened and read in front of the congregation. Not everyone could read and could write in those time. And if the letter would be opened and read, then somebody would say, I need to have a copy to take it to my hometown and read it for my friends. And they would order the copy to be made. And in such a way, the others and further, further, the letters would be spread around. By the way, in the first and the earliest manuscripts, we don't find the word Ephesus. And another very important fact, we don't know nothing about previous letter which Paul wrote to Ephesus. We would have two letters to Ephesus. We also lost hold of another Corinthians letter. We would have three letters to Corinthians. We don't have letter to a Laodicean church. We got hold only few letters what he wrote to the churches and now trying to make sense without knowing the entire correspondence of Paul between this local churches and him. And it is a private correspondence. 
No wonder we have so much wrong interpretations. Look at this ancient Greek writing. Do you see? There is no space between the words, between the sentences, paragraphs or even chapters. Everything is written in capital letters. Only in the 4th and 6th century we inserted punctuation. It doesn't belong to the oldest, neither Old nor New Testament. Letter to Ephesians was written 61st, 62nd year AD. It is 6 to 10 years after Paul saw his beloved church last time. During his second missionary journey, Paul spent about two years, three months in Ephesus and left afterwards to Jerusalem for the feasts. He writes himself he spent three years in Ephesus. He entrusted his beloved church to the missionaries Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos. And we know as well that Apostle John and Jesus' mother was members of Ephesus Church. And maybe that is the reason why church was blooming in love and care to each other. And who knows, maybe after departing of John and after death of Jesus' mother, they experienced such a loss, they lost their love as well, what we're reading in Revelation. This letter of Paul to Ephesians is the highest doxology of Paul among all the letters. It is the top praise to God the Father and Jesus Christ. Facing emperor and his imminent death, it is like he is writing a hymn, the last song before his death, to God the Father and his Son. He starts his letter with normal hating. It is who wrote the letter, author, himself, what is his occupation, and recipient, to whom the letter is addressed to. After the heading, he starts with blessings. What is the blessings for Jewish person? The blessings is braha or brahot. The blessings will be out of the lips of the Jewish person in the morning when he wakes up lunchtime and the afternoon before you go to sleep. With the blessings, Jewish person will bless the Lord God as it's written in Psalms. Bless my soul, the Lord God. Jewish person will bless the Lord for any gift he receives. In Deuteronomy 8 verse 10 is written, When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Praise the Lord, it means bless the Lord in Hebrew. Bracha or brachot. The Jewish person would say in this manner, Baruch atah Adonai Elohim, Melech HaOlam. And further, he will add what he is thankful for. In Israel, I would hear very often from the lips of the Jew, Baruch Hashem, which means Blessed be his name. They would not pronounce the name of the Lord, but they would say Hashem, the name. Why do they say Bracha? Because it is dependence. The dependence on the Lord, on every single gift. Gift of life, gift of food, gift of health, gift of mercy, gift of sunshine, gift of blessing in the bread which they eat, in the wine and drinks that you drink. Why we bless the Lord? Because He first blessed us, and that's what the Paul writing about. He says, Baruch, Baruch, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. He blessed us first, and now we're blessing Him. He blessed us with life, He blessed us with salvation, and He blessed us with eternity. And he blessed us with his son, Jesus Christ, and everything in Christ is our gift. The section of blessing is from verse 3 to verse 14, 11 verses. It is just a song, a big poem to God, blessing of God. In Greek, it would be translated elogeo, to say good words, to say a praise, and that's how Paul will translate in his mind thinking Aramaic, translating into Greek, Blessed be the Lord. 
If you open any English translation, you will find from five to nine sentences. Different translation, different amount. In Paul letter, it is just one sentence. Can you imagine? And another aspect about this poem. In this poem, there is no verb. Of course, verb is implied. But it is like a song that very often Pentecostal brothers and sisters singing. Exclamations, adverbal subordinate sentences and adjectives. Father blessed us before the creation in his son. He looked further than our fall, our shortcoming, our human nature. And he looked into eternity and granted us redemption in his son. In order that in him we could be holy and blameless. Holy, set apart, particular, special people, special nation. And blameless, anemone is Greek, spotless, without any fault, without any wrong. It is holy, set apart, divided from the rest for the certain purpose and blameless. You choose a lamb for sacrifice and bring it to the Lord. Look at this flower called Amonum in Greek, blameless. Spotless, the same name what Paul is writing about. This flower is cardamom flower with a beautiful scent used in sanctuary. Why God gave us all these blessings, brahut, from beginning, from creation of the world, because of his benevolence and his purpose to glorify his name, to see his name, his character in us. He redeemed us, as Paul says, through Christ. What does it mean to redeem an ancient world? If you get so poor that you have to sell part of your property, your land, or even yourself, and you become a slave to somebody, on every 50th year you will be released. But you don't need to wait half of your life if you have a relative who is willing to pay for you. And it is obligation of your nearest kin to take your debt about himself and to pay for you, to free you from your debt. And that nearest relative for us, the debtors, the slaves to sin, became Jesus Christ, our nearest relative, our brother, through our blood. He paid it all for us. And we own him, our life and freedom. About that life, holy life, beautiful life, life for the glory of the Lord, will be entire letter of Paul about. And we're looking forward to read the entire letter. God bless you in your study.